Thank you all for coming. Um, I have some prepared remarks, but I also wanted to speak a little bit more ad hoc at times to tell you about how I came to the questions that were raised in this book and what some of the insights that I took away from my research. And I want to start with a quote. I'm tempted to just start reading the book to you, but it's probably not, not the way. So I'm just going to read the quote that starts the introduction, which is a quote from ExxonMobil. And it's their outlook for energy in 2040. A house, a car, lights at night and heat in the winter, a refrigerator to keep food fresh and a stove for cooking, a better education and a good job, modern healthcare, wireless communications, technology and innovation, the freedom to focus one's daily activities on something more than mere subsistence. These are among the many benefits of modern energy. So why energy? Because energy is vital in our everyday lives. And this quote, I think, is perfect in that it shows us the common sense logic of energy that operates in the political field in which um, most of the way we talk about energy, we make an assumption about energy's connection to power, to work, and also to well-being. And what I was interested in is that in the history of science, in the history of technology, of course, energy is a rather recent knowledge field. Um, it doesn't get so-called discovered in physics until the middle of the 19th century with experiments with steam engines. Um, and yet the way we think about it in politics and in history is as this sort of universal um, truth, cosmic truth even, about the world in which we can go back and connect berry gathering in the Pleistocene to um, water wheels in ancient civilizations to steam engines today and say something about the span of human existence on the earth as it relates to energy. So in this sense, the book is very much motivated by the question of what happens if we take energy to be historical? What happens if we do what those of you who um, are familiar with Foucault might think of a more genealogical approach to energy or even just an intellectual history of energy? Um, and what surprised me, the first surprise, uh, was that although I had studied science as an undergrad and took pretty advanced physics and chemistry and biology courses, I hadn't um, researched much about the history of the science of energy. And so I, too, had kind of imbibed the notion of energy as this timeless truth alongside matter in terms of the history of its knowledge. So it was surprising to me to find that it's very modern, um, it's a Victorian science, and it is born right around the same time as the science of evolution. And the reason this is important is as I'm digging into the way um, energy enters the scene in physics, I see right away that in physics, energy um, becomes this calculation that is related to work and power. And that very kind of technical set of calculations that you can do to measure the efficiency of a machine is often naturalized when we talk about energy politically. So as an example, in physics, energy is defined as the ability to work, to do work. And power is defined as the rate of work done. Uh, and that works in an engineering situation in which you're trying to make a steam engine work better, for example. But my argument is that this is just one way of thinking about what energy might mean to us when we think about human well-being, when we think about human social organization, when we think about how we want to organize energy systems for the best um, life and the best sustainability. 
But that sort of engineer's definition of energy, I think, has been dominant, has dominated all these other ways and practices of energy. And the result is that in the contemporary politics of energy, you will see that it is almost impossible to talk about energy without talking about work. And in terms of many of the Republican energy plans, it's jobs. So one example I like is that there, um, one of the congressional Republican leaders talking about his plan for energy, he said, this plan is jobs, jobs, jobs. And therefore, um, what I notice is that when we accept the association between energy and work, and then don't really question the next step, which is what is the relationship between work and well-being, we've, made, we've kind of accepted that energy work power, which engineering tells us, is also um, just inherently true about the politics of energy. And therefore, when we talk, for example, about energy freedom in politics, that often and almost always means an independent supply of energy for a particular nation state. Like, for example, we can get natural gas from Texas and not from the Middle East. That's energy freedom in many of these conversations. So instead, by doing this genealogy of energy, I wanted to start to think about, one, um, how this energy work connection gets established in science, and then how very quickly in the 19th century uh, metaphors about energy start to infuse the governance of labor. And it's often missed because um, energy is such a capacious word that when it appears, or when it, the metaphors about energy appear, um, they're not always necessarily referencing thermodynamics. So it doesn't always look like thermodynamics is kind of a knowledge that's happening in terms of the governance of labor. But because thermodynamics was such a revolutionary field in the sciences of the 19th century, these words had quite a lot of um, power in terms of their association with um, science and all these novel fields of knowledge and also the association with steam engines and people who worked on steam engines because most of the early scientists of energy were, were concerned with the efficiency of steam engines. So uh, the first part of the book is really about this history of energy and trying to disrupt the notion that energy is discovered, that it's a natural fact. Um, and I find a lot of physicists who refer to energy as an epistemology, a set of calculations. Um, and even that there is no such thing as energy, which is great because I can have physicists say that instead of me. Um, but then I think about, well, what does that mean politically? Um, and I think, as I've said, one thing it means is that we, when we think about energy, we have such a limited imagination because we're so working within the realm of what I call this engineering version of energy, the energy work power nexus. The second part of the book is really about how this new knowledge about energy um, infuses labor governance. And in that I talk a lot about how energy meshes with evolution um, in terms of <laughs> offering a new set of tools and techniques for surveilling bodies, mapping bodies, in terms of hierarchies. Um, we are all likely very familiar with the way that evolution um, plays out in social Darwinism and plays out in imperialism. Um, but I argue that energy itself, and this really comes about through logics of maximizing work and minimizing waste, are important to explaining how evolution works in terms of this imperial logic. So evolution might say certain peoples are more evolutionary advanced than others, energy provides these mathematical equations by which um, you could purportedly measure the efficiency of different work activities and therefore have a way not only to justify hierarchies but also to govern laboring bodies and to justify um, racist and gendered practices. So one in one part of that book I look at 
some new technical schools, which is kind of related to being at Virginia Tech because the technical school movement in the US emerges in the um, third, uh, last third of the 19th century, which is about when Virginia Tech is founded and schools like MIT and Caltech. But at the same time that you have um, these schools for engineering, you also have movements to um, educate newly enfranchised black children and also forcibly um, moved ch uh, Native American children who are put into boarding schools, so schools like the Hampton Institute, which is nearby, and the Carlisle School up in Pennsylvania, both thought of themselves now as technical schools. And I look at some of those textbooks and see how these metaphors about energy and work and waste really help to inspire how these schools think about the necessity of hierarchies of laboring bodies and who deserves what. And um, one of my favorite parts of that section is this whole part of the textbook, it's called Economic Crumbs for the Working People or something, and this is a Hampton Institute textbook. And the author, who's a white industrialist, who's using the students to do underpaid or maybe not even paid labor at his oyster canning factory, uses energy science to say, well, there has to be a difference in wages because the difference of energy is what allows for work. If, uh, if all um, energy were equally distributed, you couldn't do work because this is behind work. You have like a concentration of heat, for example, in one place, and that's how you can do work. So all of these metaphors about energy were very helpful in the Imperial Project. Finally, in the conclusion of the book, I talk about what this might mean for energy politics today. And in that um, part, I think about how this connection between energy and work was naturalized, what it might mean to refuse that coupling. And for, in that sense, I think about the way that even environmentalists and many in environmental politics often uh, have to speak in the language of jobs and um, efficiency and minimizing waste and sort of get into like accounting battles over counting energy. And I want to think about and propose what it might mean to be think more expansively about what energy means and its connection to human well-being. Thank you.